boa tarde. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Analyst Day. I am Marília Nogueira, IR Officer for ADP Brazil. It is a pleasure to have you all here today with us. During this meeting, which should last about an hour and a half, we'll give you a strategic overview of the company for the coming years, based on solid governance, sustainability, and innovation. The presentation will be conducted by the CEO, João Marques da Cruz, by our CFO, Henrique Freitas, and will be followed by a session of uh, questions and answers, gathering the whole management team. You can start posting your question at our platform's chat box. And also, of course, remember to identify yourself. Before we start, it is important to say that this event is following all safety protocols. It is an important moment that requires empathy and mutual care. And I hope, on behalf of EDP, that you are all well and safe. This way, I now turn the floor over to Mr. Cruz. Thank you, Marilia. And good afternoon, everyone. First, and uh, welcome. Those are essential words, especially in a very difficult moment we're all going through, and we are following all rules to fight the pandemic. But it's also fundamental that we are here today with you, all of us safe, so that we can uh, express our commitments here in Brazil. It is key to us to communicate with the market. We're talking about a market that uh, values our shares at the stock market today. So it is our duty to talk and explain our strategy to you, a strategy we believe to be a winning one, but it's more importantly that you also believe. And that's why we're all here gathered today and this afternoon to communicate with you. All right, let's then start with our action for the day. Our topic is called Our Commitments. Our commitments because a company needs to be a set of values. Values for the future, which starts off in the present, but that go beyond the everyday procedures. Those are our commitments for a long period. We're talking about 21 through 2025. Uh, in this five-year uh, period, we believe that uh, EDP is clearly ready for the future. And what does that mean? We are a, an investment platform, an investment which will be sustainable, as it has been for some time, a type of investment which will be accelerated. In other words, we will invest more than we invested in previous years. We would like, without a doubt, give you returns which will be attractive, combining those economic returns with a proactive agenda around ESG matters. That's our main commitment, the commitment from a group which operates across 20 countries. But in Brazil, we are a listed company, EDP Brazil, when where uh, the controlling shareholder holds 55% of the capital, but a company that intends to uh, comply with the good governance of a locally listed company here in Sao Paulo. Our portfolio now, those curves, those meanders of energetic or energy transition, we are now gathered 3,300 people uh, with an EBITDA of 3.4 billion uh, BRLs. Uh, the EBITDA has been growing for the past few years. Our net uh, income sit at around half of that at 1.5 billion. We operate across five businesses. Distribution. In distribution, we control two discos, one here in Sao Paulo and one in the state of Espiritu Santo. We have a significant share at Celesc uh, in the state of Santa Catarina. Uh, on top of that, we are very strong in conventional generation, uh, be it uh, hydro uh, generation, be it thermal generation. We have approximately three gigawatts of installed capacity in conventional generation. For transmission, while that's also an important pillar, we are now operating or building seven 
different transmission lots. We're talking about transmission lines that extend to over 1,500 kilometers. And uh, because of that, we are contributing decisively to uh, transmission for the Brazilian electric uh, grid. In terms of trading, we are uh, present in this business with hundreds of clients and we trade energy, which is produced by EDP and energy which we buy from other suppliers in the market. Lastly, solar generation. That's the future. That's why it's the last one I'd like to address. We have been investing significantly in solar uh, generation. Brazil is a country that lends itself uh, to that kind of energy uh, exploration. And EDP wants to be part of that portfolio that Brazil is so fitting. We have invested uh, in 50 megawatts, but in the future, we want to go over 50 megawatts to a number closer to one giga. And why are, as we're talking to investors and analysts, it is important always to have in mind that we need to be uh, efficient in capital allocation. We want to ensure the best possible returns to our shareholders. How can we do that? Through a good dividend policy. Uh, our dividend policy is quite clear, quite straightforward, and we will implement that. Have no doubt that dividend policy will be delivered. And what does it say, that dividend policy? It simply says that there is a minimum dividend of one real with a payout ratio equivalent to over 50% of the adjusted net income. In practice, it means that if we cannot invest with the necessary financial discipline, which has been our landmark, then we will uh, conduct a buyback of our shares or we'll uh, pay an extraordinary level of dividends. That's our new dividend policy. Uh, historically, as you can see on the screen, uh, has seen an important uptrend for the past five years, but it will surely be even more important in the coming years. And that will connect us to 2025. And this is the bridge between today and 2025. Our strategic positioning is based around four pillars. I like to say we have two pairs of strategic lines. Growth with financial discipline on the one hand, as we look to other, other business, and also to have efficiency in our current businesses. So a few words for each of one of the pillars. Growth. We have three main growth avenues. Distribution, no doubt. Transmission will be uh, happening from organic investments. M&A is something that we cannot say it won't happen, but the focus is on organic investment. Transmission. We want to be quite active around transmission. Active in buying rights to build transmission lines. And how can we do that? Through auctions, which are organized by public entities, or also through uh, M&As in the secondary market. Solar. Solar is our expectation for the future, our sure bet for the future. As it is a future bet, we want to significantly grow uh, in solar to exceed, uh, to get close to a bit, to one gig in solar, what we call utility scale, in other words, large scales. Uh, in distributed uh, generation. We're going to address that solar with uh, a partnership with ADP Renewables. It's a sister company. And as our friends say up north, uh, uh, it's a win-win situation because ADP Renewables is a big company which has a lot of expertise in solar technology and we are in our turn, a very efficient company in Brazil. So combined together, when we bring together technology and market expertise, we will be able to win in this 
new solar market and we will have solar plants at utility scales in which uh, EDP intends to consolidate financially. In terms of financial discipline, as I said, it is the counterpart of growth. We need to grow, but we need to grow under uh, high profitability rates. We do not want to grow for the sake of growing. I've mentioned our dividend policy. It will uh, happen so that our net debt EBITDA ratio sits at around 2.5 to 3 times so that we can uh, preserve uh, a healthy level of leverage. In terms of efficiency, efficiency is quite important. Be it operation uh, in the operating side, uh, as it refers to distribution, and also in transmission, as all our lots will be completed before time and under budget. It, that can that can be done if we have a very proactive approach using zero budget based programs so we won't have uh, leftovers but efficiency has also to do with recycling our asset portfolio that's something very important we do believe in asset rotation we believe that the crystallized value means that when an asset becomes operational, in other words, transmission lots, we want to build them, but we want to have a good foundation. When it becomes operational, we need to put it out in the market, crystallizing that amount, anticipating gains, and replacing the capital cost of a company such as ours, a utility company, replacing that by the capital cost of other uh, entities that might have a lower cost than we do. Future businesses, we, we want to be ready for the future. And future in Brazil is market liberalization. That has already started, should continue, I have no doubt. Uh, you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will be able to choose from the comfort of your home, your energy trading company. Choose the company from which you will buy your energy. And we want to be ready for that future through a digital transformation, through an integrated offering of our portfolio of services in terms of energy trading and also solar solutions and also uh, e mobility, which is also part of that future. Energy transition is, without a doubt, something also very, very important because of climate implications, but also because of the people involved. When you sit at the core of the transition, we see the clients. Clients will be the contact point between generators using multiple types of uh, energy, most of which will be renewable, and on the other hand, service providers, namely the uh, operator of the transmission lines. So that partnership where we have clients sitting at the center and with, when it becomes more decentralized across its energy flows, stops being unidirectional and start being multi-directional. That's the kind of future we want to have. So the view of an informed, demanding technology customer interacting with a grid which is complex, but it's reliable and safe. We are an organization which is ready and adapted to this new reality. This is our planet, Earth, the planet uh, we want to be part of leading the energy transition, and we have commitments at the EDP group level. And the first one is by 2025, we want to have deconsolidated, financially speaking, all investments in coal, the ones we are, which are existing right now in Brazil. We have the Pesang plant. So starting in 2025, uh, we won't, we'll, we'll no longer control that plant. And in 2030, we'll be carbon neutral, thus contributing 
to something which is quite important, which is to the mitigation of the emission of greenhouse uh, gases. And we and this is a part of our committing with the with nature, with the environment. That's part of our DNA. Count on us on that front as well. But before getting there, we need to invest. We always need to invest. Uh, we invest 10 billion BRLs in the next five years. A significant, considerable investment. 60% in transmission, 3 billion. Actually, distribution is an area where we plan to double our investments. In the next five years, we'll invest twice as much as we invested in the past five years, but also in solar energy, transmission, and some investment in generation as well. Lastly, our EBITDA. We believe it is possible to deliver an EBITDA which will grow between 8 and 10 percent yearly for the next five years. Uh, it will continue to be a diversified EBITDA. It is good to be diversified. It is positive. EBITDA reduces risk. And, and you, as our uh, shareholders, our current, our potential, we want that risk to be minimum. So you want to have 39% uh, in distribution and conventional generation with 21% and transmission at 18%. But it's important to have in mind we're talking about an integrated company, a company which has multiple technologies which are adjusted to our world, to our reality. Those are our commitments, but our plan also has numbers. And to address our numbers, I'd like to invite Anhiki Freitas, our CFO, who will introduce you to our numbers, numbers which underlie our commitments 2021 through 2025. And Hiki, thank you, João. I think our commitments have become really clear. It's important also to look at our numbers and check what we have uh, committed to deliver in the coming five years. So let's look at distribution first, to where we'll invest the most in the four, next five years. We'll invest uh, 6 billion BRLs between 21 and 25 which is uh, the equivalent of twice as much as we invested um, from 2016 through 2020. We'll uh, expand the, the grid, improve, and also fight losses and invest in technology. That will uh, represent in two point time, five times to three times in time in terms of QRR. This will increase our BRR, which will move from 5 to 8 billion BRLs, our net BRR. This will reflect in our regulatory EBITDA, which will grow about 40%, considering, of course, we'll have uh, a refusal of less than 1% in our investments. It's also important to understand where we'll focus our efficiency across different distribution projects. We want to invest diver in a diversified manner, namely what you want to avoid. Technical and no technical losses, delinquency and default. And then in terms of uh, parameter quality, DAC and FAC, we want to monitor them closely, of course. And this will reflect in the reduction of our OPEX coming through efficiency gains. How are we going to do that? I'll give you an example. This is a sensor project for the grid, which will allow us to remotely monitor uh, and also to monitor uh, cutoffs and uh, of lines from a distance as well, remotely. And also, it'll help us fight fraud. We're also talking about uh, network automation, which, which will allow our operation to be more flexible and will improve DAC and FAC as a consequence because you'll be able to observe the, the whole of our clients. Then we'll, technology also, and that technology will be with BT0. That's something you already know. Uh, to combat uh, stealing of energy, losing of energy, and that will allow us to 
address both losses and and frauds. Uh, uh, small size substations also important to mitigate technical losses and also important to, uh, in, of course, address the loss of loads between substations. So this is a set of measures that we have in the pipeline. But it's also important to understand in technological terms what we're doing to fight losses on the one hand and also to improve our uh, revenue on the other hand and also fighting delinquency. That's specifically important in this year, of course, this past year with the pandemic hitting hard. This was uh, uh, a critical variable, a great source of concern for the company. We could not leave fraud uh, untouched. Clients needed to pay our their bills. So we have uh, combined technology systems such as georeferencing systems with uh, database, and we integrated data with using AI, and that allows us to fight in a more efficient manner. We have prepared a short video. It tries to give an example in a simple way of how it works in practice. So let's watch the video now. How can we use technology to maximize lost combat projects? By using tools and georeferencing, it is possible to monitor different regions, stations, feeders, the opening and closure, having better combat actions for that context. This is done with artificial intelligence, with different inspection actions that are more effective. Efficiency is implemented with an increase in accuracy of 30% between 2017 and 2020. And there is a mean recovery of 0 0.69 per hour in 2020 inspections recovered 207 gigawatts per hour, which corresponds to 41 million BRLs in savings. The pandemic also led to huge challenges to meet our financial health. We invest in technology. We integrated information of our clients, created a decision-making tree so that we can have better actions for our defaulting clients. We also have a segmentation of clients who made their payments before electricity was discontinued. With that, we can monitor the efficacy, improving our operational efficiency. We have an efficiency of 80%. This corresponds to 809 millions, and this is only part of what we've been doing to guarantee the revenue investments anticipated for the next years will lead to more efficient, more digital, and more innovating processes. I hope that uh, this video has helped you understand how we fight losses and how we can uh, fight defaulting clients. Uh, we had a very challenging year with a pandemic. One of the good things we did in this time is technology. We invested in technology to improve our efficiency. Of course, we're going to use the technologies that we're familiar with. We're not proposing new technologies or technologies that are unknown. We want to make them more effective so that our operations are more effective. We want to increase our ETA 8 to 10% per year over the next five years. How are we going to add this growth? Part of it will come directly by tariff reductions. Part of it will come from the market. And we also reduce losses. We'll have a recovery there, and then we have OPEX with investments, and therefore 
this is the growth we anticipate for the next five years. And I will talk a little bit about transmission and some of the critical factors for our success. This is a segment that ADP has come into, and Jean has already mentioned that. We have 3.6 billion BRLs of CAPEX right now. We are concluding most of our lots, but we have uh, a total CAPEX of 4.3 billion that we are going to accomplish. Uh, we have a VPL greater than 2.5 billion, but it's also important for us to understand the moment we're going through. All of the lots we have today have a an RAP over KPAX and of about 15 percent. This results from the picture where we captured most of the lots in the auction, and it's much superior than what we have in the market now. We have an existing market with transactions between seven to eight percent of wrap capex. We want to rotate our assets so that we can consolidate value. Therefore, we intend to keep our transmission, but we also want to implement a technique or a project or asset rotation that will allow us to have value crystallization. And therefore, I think that we have a very favorable condition here for us now to help us cope with the next few years and then early next year. We'll have more auctions in the primary market and the secondary market as well, but we will also have some lines assured with some of our businesses already concluded. They will start operating and will allow us to add value. We also talked about uh, thermal generation. We want to have the decarbonization of the group. There is a clear pledge that by 2025, we would have deconsolidated all of our coal units. This is very relevant. With that, we can generate at the above 4.9 billion. We also have to take into account the thermal energy from the northeast of the country. That's very important for the operator of the system in the northeast region. I'd like to remind you also that we have a contract with one of uh, the best CVUs. It's very efficient, but of course, uh, we have our agenda and we have to follow the global principles of the group. They will be extended for over 15 years. In this scenario, we already have some visibility for the continuation of the plant as shareholders at EDP or, you know, we have this logic of going on with the plant beyond 2025. So we've talked about uh, conventional power plants. We have an installed capacity of 2.2 gigawatts. This energy in the midterm and long term will uh, grow a little bit more in the free market. But 90% of this is already contracted. It's important to share with you this vi our vision for this lot. We have the consolidated case is someone well, and the non-consolidated today represent 1.5 billion, and they are discounted from the consolidated assets. But I wanted to share with you the risks. This is nothing new. It's not different from what you already know. It's a reality. We systematically have 
GFF in the order of 80 percent. And we have the renewables and the consolidation of these two areas lead to energy offering as one of the critical factors here with our current portfolio. We would have 1 billion BRLs, but the risk is uh, translated into almost 50% of this. If we didn't do anything, what would our risk be with uh, energy that uh, is already contracted? energy that we buy by edging and the results we've had. We have been able to deliver results that are very similar to our energy. And this is the truth of it. But of course, there is some risk involved. This is relevant. And it's important for us to share with you our vision we will continue with conventional generation. And as we increase our presence in the renewables market, of course, we will decrease it here. And now let's talk a little bit about solar generation. The first aspect is how will this market grow? We have some that are more optimistic, others less optimistic, but the market will be very significant by the end of this decade. We're going to have a market of about uh, 38 gigawatts. Therefore, it is very significant. But how do we see this market? And how are you going to work with it? We usually divide this market into four groups or four types. Uh, first of all, we have a B2C and B2B. For this market, we have some acquisition of a network which will enable us to go into with this lot. But we also have B2B with a remote consumers and we have free market up to 20 megawatts. Acquisition of AES for production. We recently purchased AES Innova's portfolio and in the short term, it will allow us to expand our presence in this market. We also have type three, which is also a B2B. We have it in the free market above 20 megawatts intended for large customers. And of course, this is done in a partnership, in a joint venture with renewables, which will allow us to have global access and access to technology in global terms. It will be an expansion factor. These three segments is something that we want to strengthen in the near future in EDP. There is a fourth type, ACR, the regulated market auction. This market is uh, something that we will participate by means of our subsidiaries. We have already positioned ourselves as a segment pioneer. We have already hired a portfolio of 100 megawatts B. But our ambition for 2025 is to reach one giga. This is based on partnerships with renewable energies, acquisitions of M&As and blue soil auctions. But we also anticipate trends, connections, and of course, we're going to use all of our digital resources to help us grow in the Brazilian market. Let's change topic now. We're going to talk about the financial aspect so that we can fund all of these projects. First of all, we are always very careful in terms of managing our debt. Last year, 2020, it was especially difficult year. It was There was a lot of risk for liquidity. And I'd like to remind you that uh, we had 3.1 billion BRLs in cash reinforcement. And 
there were conditions that were established in the market in the second quarter of 2020, and it was very important to take care of this debt. And of course, we anticipated uh, these reinforcements. And this year, we have already raised $1.8 billion at an in terms of perspective for the next few years, we focused on capital structure optimization and uh, the cost of our debt after the tax cost reduction. Of course, this is essential. And when you perform a historical analysis, it's important to evaluate the decrease of the interest rates in Brazil, but also of a better allocation of our debts and uh, also extension of uh, debt, which puts us at a much more comfortable position in managing our debts. Now, I also wanted to say a few words regarding digitalization. We have had five ZBB cycles. We have managed over 200 efficiency initiatives throughout this period. We have installed over 200 robots in our processes. And when you compare this, it's actually, uh, when you compare our OPEX in 2015 to 2020, you can see that uh, we have had an efficiency gain of 313 million, which is quite significant for 2025. We will continue investing in these initiatives. We have over 120 new efficiency initiatives that have already been identified. They will lead to growth, and therefore, all of this will be translated into commitment to growth. Regarding our numbers, I think I've uh, said um, what I had to share with you, and uh, I will turn back to João for his final words. Thank you, Enrique. Your numbers have been very clear, and as I said, businesses are based on ideas but they are also based on numbers. After all, we have to deliver numbers, and therefore, my final words had to include innovation. We are going to build the future without forgetting our present. EDP is really proud of its innovation. It's an open innovation. In other words, it interacts with different ecosystems, starts ups, and they all help us and we help one another to develop, to put innovation into practice. We use different technologies from acceleration to mentorship, development of processes and new products using all of these startups. And at the end of the day, we invest in these companies using our ventures. We are a company that are 100% part of EDP Brazil. And of course, we want to invest. But our investment in innovation goes beyond. We have an internal process of investment in innovation. Usually, we invest close to 200 million BRLs. This year, we're going to invest 246 million BRLs, and our expectation is to double our investment in innovation in the next five years. So what are the areas that are essential for innovation? The answer is all of them. They include distribution by smart grids, e-mobility, which is part of our service concept, operational digitalization or new solar models. In other words, innovation is essential. It is part of the future. For us to get there, we have to act today. 
today we already have eight startups that we have invested in. We have invested capital of approximately 20 million BRLs in these startups. And all of them are part of our system. They end up rendering innovation services to EDP companies. And so to invest in the future, we have to bet in innovation today. Now I'm going to summarize what we've seen this afternoon. Our four pillars of a strategy that is focused on the investor looking at maximizing the total shareholder return which really believes in the potential of this company. And so we have these four pillars for growth. We invest and reinforce the three core elements, which include distribution, transmission, and solar generation. But that is all based on financial discipline, which is essential. It is essential because we want to generate value invest and generate value has to include financial discipline, which is what will at the end of the day produce the results we want to have with EPS and DPS. We want them to be higher than they are today and this is what we want to deliver. Efficiency, businesses, need to be maintained and managed efficiently. Otherwise, costs will grow and we won't be able to deliver returns and therefore efficiency has to be part of our project. Future businesses, which will allow us to travel through this transition uh, journey and we'll be there with you. Thank you, Marcos da Cruz and Henrique Freire. Thank you. Before we move on to the Q&A session, I'd like to show you a video clip about how EDP Brazil has positioned itself for the past few years, expanding expectations for the future which is being built. The world is in constant transformation and we are prepared. We are a global company the largest company in Portugal and a leader in renewable energies in Europe. For over 20 years, we crossed Brazil, uh, the, the ocean, and arrived in Brazil. Here we grew, we set roots, but never sat still. Today, we are present across all the energy chain and in the everyday lives of millions of clients across the country. We have invested in the development of the country and generated thousands of jobs in the past decade. We try to keep the language that unites us together and the memories of our history to alive. We take care of our people and of nature as well. We incentivize this conscious use of energy and we think about the future. We develop today solutions that will change the world in the future. For that, we spare no efforts and we plan more for the coming years. We are digital. We are driven by innovation, by passion, and by the respect to diversity. That's the mix that defines us. We are the energy of people. We are EDP. Uh, we are very proud of all of that. We'll now start our Q&A session. Here with me, we have the whole executive management of EDP, Vice President of Distribution, João Brito, Vice President of People in ESG, Fernanda Pires, CEO, João Marques da Cruz, the CFO, Henrique Freire, Vice President of Generation, Transmission and Trading, Luis Otavio Henriques, and Vice President of Clients, Carlos Andrade. The first question comes from Marum Suarez. Hello, I'd like to know what initiatives focused on ESG of the company are being prioritized right now? Good afternoon, great, great question. 
that question will be addressed by our Vice President, Fernanda Pires. She is in charge of ESG. Fernanda, over to you, please. Thank you, Marlon, for your question. ESG for ADP is a core value. We have included that in our everyday activities, and whenever we make decisions, we take that into account. And that's why this agenda is in our strategy, is part of our commitments and of our goals. Just to give you a few examples, we are the first company in the electrical industry in Brazil to have a target to reduce CO2, which has been approved by the science-based target initiative. In other words, it's in line with uh, climate science. We have invested also socially with a positive impact. A few examples, the Reforza program, which is helping 20 uh, NGOs, and also our uh, entrepreneurship challenge in partnership with the entrepreneur women in vulnerable situation. It's also worth mentioning uh, a very strong program we have in diversity and inclusion. In addition to the targets we have set for 2022, some of them include 20% of women in leadership positions, 37% of women uh, in the workforce as a whole, and 50% of new hires are focused on groups which are underrepresented in society. It's also worth mentioning that we are now providing LGBT education and starting by the leadership level. That's a few of the examples we have around that ESG agenda. Thank you. Moving on with Marlon. Marlon has a second question. According to an article on Valor Economico last week, the EDP group would have reserved 10 million to invest in Brazil until 2025. If that information is correct, that means that those 10 billion BRLs are the ceiling, the top, the maximum, or do you have other plans for Brazil that go even further there? Uh, I thank you for your question, and that question will be addressed by our CFO, Henrique Freire. Of course, uh, being a question of a financial nature, it's, also, it's always important to be very rigorous with the numbers. Henrique, over to you. Thank you, that's a good question. When we say 10 billion, we're being very cautious, actually. Uh, if you look at the chart, we have a little circle uh, that has to do with our asset rotation for our transmission. So we are uh, including the lots we already have uh, in hand, but we are not including, for example, the multiplying effect coming from the asset rotation. So. we are investing investment, and at the end of the day, that amount might exceed 10 billion. So 10 billion is the commitment we have set, but it does not include asset rotation, which can be a factor to impact on that final number. Thank you. The third question comes from Andres Sampaio from Santander. What's the company's expectation in terms of capex for megawatt peak in solar? Uh, when we talk about solar, utility scale, or decentralized solar, uh, our Carlos Andrade, our VP, is in charge of that. So I give the floor over to him, Carlos. Thank you, João. Uh, our perspective, uh, when we look ahead for the next five years, we expect to reduce our capex per megawatt peak. Of course, when you talk about reais, you need to take into account uh, the foreign exchange devaluation. But today, in terms of distributed gener generation, smaller scale projects, we are acquiring, buying equipment outside. So 60% of the capex uh, of a solar project uh, are tied to imported inputs and therefore they are affected by the foreign exchange. But today, the cost is of about 4 million per megawatt peak, slightly above, maybe, depending on the size of the project. Why is it higher? Because you're buying, looking at the next one or two quarters. Today, there is a very strong pressure uh, for solar plates. So prices in the short run are higher. In large-scale generation, we buy at uh, 
uh, at a lower level than 2.5 million. And we buy, we are now buying for 2022 and 2023, taking into account technological advances for some plates. But those are the levels. For the next five years, we believe those prices will fall and will be a lot closer to the number of 2 million megawatts per, uh, and it'll get closer to 3 million too. That's the perspective for the five-year term going forward. The next question from Enrique Pehetti from JP Morgan. Good afternoon. As for growth and diversification of EBITDA in 2025, the forecasts take into account capital recycling, yes or no? If so, uh, is the company already invoicing future projects which have not been hired? Uh, as usual, we are very prudent, very cautious, but I'll give it over to Henrique Freire for him to address the question. Thank you, João. Well, your question is relevant. Well, are you, you mean if we are counting with the eggs before the chicken, right? That's the, the question. And I'd like to reiterate, as João said, we are quite cautious, quite prudent. We're only counting with the projects uh, and solar because uh, we already have something in place. The rest is what we have, and we are investing in distribution, but we are not counting on surplus, not coming from asset rotation. So the numbers you saw are conservative numbers at the end of the day under that perspective from where you're asking. Next question from Marcelo Sa from Itaú. Good morning, everyone. You show a growth guide, guidance for EBITDA in distribution, but the breakdown surprised me. Over 50% of the growth is coming from market and losses, and only 30% from the tariff review, even though we have a high level of investment. What is the level of losses you're expecting for 2025? The guidance suggests uh, losses which will be lower than the regulatory ones. Uh, thank you. That's the first question around distribution, and our distribution VP, João Martins, will address that. Thank you, João. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 21 25, we only have one tariff review uh, 22 in Espiritu Santo and 23 in Sao Paulo. And that's the reason why part of the capex is not reverting yet. And the losses topic is critical for us. We have invested over a billion uh, reais uh, across several technologies, as Henrique Freire just mentioned, to reduce total losses. And we intend in 2023 to reach the regulatory target and remain there until 2025. Next question from Daniel from Banco Safra. Good afternoon, everyone. You did mention the lower exposure to GSF. What kind of investments can we expect around that initiative? Very good, thank you. I'd like to turn the floor over to Enrique Freire to address that question as well, please. Uh, I think we made it clear that we want to diminish our exposure to hydro energy, and as we increase our footprint in solar, it would be only natural that we will see uh, we'll have to divest some of our assets. And that's basically the point. It's a bit premature for us to anticipate what kind of assets uh, going forward we're going to be investing in. Uh, there will be a, a decrease in exposure as we move forward in the execution of that business plan. Next question from Giovanni Nunes. I'd like to know if there is any forecast of investments in public lighting uh, projects, given the fostering of uh, public projects across the country. Well, I'll uh, send that question to João Brito Martins, because it is part of our distribution business as well. Uh, that's a business we have looked at before. It has a different risk level when compared to the ones we have in our current operations. Of course, it is in our radar. We're going to assess it, but it's not a, a major priority yet. 
Next question, William Souza. In what concerns the thermoelectric plant of Pesce? Can you go into detail about the de decarbonization process, please? Okay, good. That's the first question about generation. And our generation and transmission VP, Luis Otavio, please, okay, you can address that. Luis, good afternoon, everyone. Well, the decarbonization has two different fronts or two different st steps. First, you decrease your share from the total, you deconsolidate, and then you'll have less carbon uh, from the company. And then a second step is uh, to grow around hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen within the Pesain plant. When we combine those two steps, we'll have a better perspective of how to go about decarbonization. Next question from Pedro Manfredini. In terms of new technologies, the company continues to map out M&As with startups or independent companies which are pioneer in specific areas, or do you plan to work on that in-house? I'll uh, direct that question to Carlos Andrade. He is in charge of innovation, but I'll, I'll just add something and say that innovation area uh, and the startup area is something which we deem to be extremely important. It's part of our DNA. Having said that, Carlos, over to you. Well, Pedro, we will, uh, we certainly have a corporate venture capital vehicle, our ADP Ventures Brazil, that's our vehicle. And we invest directly in startups through that vehicle. So promising startups, startups that are related with our business and with the future, new business models, new, new technologies, that is a priority for us. And we've been doing this through that vehicle. We have smaller minority stakes in those companies, investing around 2 million reais on average. Today we have already seven uh, investments of that nature, and we continue to look for startups that might be interesting for us here in Brazil. At the same time, we acquired a company which is no longer a startup, uh, a larger company where we also acquired a minority sharehold, but it's a company that has a different uh, business model. They work with solar franchises, and that uh, intends to grow in a smaller scale. That didn't make sense for us to develop that organically. I'm talking about smaller scale growth. So we decided to invest in a company which already has franchises across the country. And it's, as I said, a new business model for solar. So we are testing the waters there. It is part of our growth plan, especially in solar. It's part of our growth strategy to search for uh, partnerships, either for startups or uh, companies which have distinguished themselves in new technologies. Rafael Borges has the next question. It is, common, is it common for distributing CapEx to be higher when we get closer to tariff review? How do you plan to distribute that CapEx from 2021 through 2025? Uh, another question about distribution. I'll just add something, then I'll move it over to uh, João Martins to address that. But for us, investments in distribution is always essential irrespective of tariff cycles. Thank you, João. Of course, the tariff cycle is, is important. As close, as, as we get closer to the tariff review, uh, things get more important. We, of course, have maintained the minimum level of investment, but we work across a, an investment curve after the first year, and then it grows and reaches the maximum. Uh, just before the next uh, review. So that's why uh, we expect to invest six billion in the next five years. Of course, in the first year, we'll, we'll invest more and uh, in Espiritu Santo and then in Sao Paulo, and then that number uh, goes down and goes up again as we get closer to the new tariff review. That's how we assess that uh, capital allocation across distribution. Next question from Joana Freire. Thank you for the call. I'd like to ask you about the group's strategy about Brazil. 
Has there been any change in the controller shareholder view? Can you comment on the migration of the previous uh, CEO and the arrival of the new CEO in Brazil? Well, I'll address that myself. Actually, there was no change in view in terms of strategy. Brazil remains a very important market for the company when you talk about international investments by ADP Group. And proof of that are the numbers that have been listed in our strategic plan. In other words, in 2025, ADP Brazil will be bigger than it is today. It will be different, of course, because the world will be different. The world evolves, EDP Brazil evolves, evolves as well. In terms of uh, changing positions are, uh, are also very common. Uh, people change positions, change places, change jobs. That has nothing to do with uh, a different view or different priorities or anything like, like that. Thank you. Next question from Renato Pinto. Investments made in solar energy are related to projects which have been approved or not. How do you see the price trend in solar energy with so many approved projects made to explore that offering of subsidies by the government? That question could make the headlines because it uh, talks about uh, current events. Congratulations on your on your question. Carlos Andrade will address that. Just an observation. Solar will be increasingly more important across the world and in Brazil as well, irrespective of subsidies uh, or not. It'll go. Carlos, over to you. Okay. Well, uh, there is one first aspect that John started answering. If you get IPE's uh, projections, uh, they have a plan up to 2030 for solar distributed generation. They have a perspective with regulatory changes, regulatory changes that are not quite significant, and without regulatory changes. And if you get the projection until 2025 with regulatory changes, which is what you already is expect, and NL has already indicated that there will be some readjust readjustments, and they actually started in 2019. So the growth will continue to be exponential. PE's projection for 2025 with all of the regulatory requirements is greater than 20% per year. So the compounded growth and therefore the growth of solar energy is irreversible. The scenario is very competitive, but you have significant growth in a continental size country. That's why you have different competitors, not only companies like ours, but they are very well prepared for distributed generation, large scale generation. We have distribution. We know the market well. We have a capacity to deliver projects. But for companies like ours, there are tens of uh, different companies in the market. Growth will remain exponential. The market is very large. And therefore, the trend as a business is to continue growing. And this is something that we will keep on doing. The next question is from Rael Magano, Credit Suisse. Good afternoon. Can you see some level of pressure to close long-term energy contracts because of new renewable projects that are coming in with compatible prices? And if so, what is the price range that you see? Very good question. Basically, this is a trading question, and that's why I will turn it over to Luis Otavio. We have two changing scenarios. One of them is the short-term scenario. The other one is the long-term scenario, which has to do with a, an opening of the market. Regardless of regulating the free market, you will have costs 
issues that will take you forward, uh, taking into consideration marginal costs. There will be no changes. Short-term changes do not seem reasonable. But the, it wasn't the market that changed this. It was the marginal cost. If you have less than 10 BRLs, you have to once again analyze the exchange rate. There are different components that are related to the dollar price. And with that, 100 BRLs will be 100 or 150 in the short or midterm. I do not see any change or any trends for changes in the future price of energy in the regulated market or in the free market. Well, we have another question from Pedro from the Manfaz Group. With the release of consumption in regulated market, long-term prices will change. Will prices converge? With And the cost today is below 100. Well, we have a question on long-term estimates. Luis, well, that's part of the question I just gave. We do not think that one market will affect the other. You have consumption and marginal prices. The trend for marginal prices, if you have any technological changes, it, you know, it, it will grow. It's related to the previous question. It does not depend on economic variables. We have to take into account the actual cost in BRLs. The next question comes from a physical person, and it's on distribution. How do you see the group's distributors before and after the pandemic? Well, we hope that uh, the pandemic will be over. <laughs> The beginning of the pandemic uh, required a lot of work from our organization. We tried to assure the health and safety of our employees. Having done that and having taken the right measures, we then started working in the digital environment, be it in our relationship with our clients. And today, we have over 75% of our distributors with con digital contact versus uh, something close to 20%, uh, which is very positive. We have worked a lot with our model and we have digital payments and special picks, which has been very successful in the recent past. And then we also have our structure. Remote work has allowed us to have a structure that works in a more integrated and faster manner. The company is more flexible and has a better capacity to provide proper responses. And then Enrique highlighted our numbers in his presentation. He talked about our losses and our developments. We have had different initiatives developed so that we can work with our information better to improve our efficiency, be it with our teams or to fight fraud or other tools that we use to improve our defaulting rates. In the beginning of the pandemic, we were very concerned about how we would move on, but we are now stronger, more flexible, and the digital environment, which has grown a lot in the company. The next question comes from a physical person investor. How are the transmission construction work moving and how is it going to evolve in the company? Well, uh, we're going to turn our over to Luis Otavio. I will make a short note. We are really dedicated to maintaining distribution and develop it, of course, within a concept of rotation of our, us, of our assets. Luis Otavio, please. 
I will talk a little bit about the transmission constructions. Uh, he has shared some of our numbers. We used a very positive strategy. It uh, was um, more marked because of the pandemic, of course. With that, we were able to progress during the pandemic that we've been going through since March last year. We have been able to deliver a large part of the lots. We have 7 11, 24 from Espiritu Santo. They have all been delivered, and we are quickly in the Rio Grande do Sul lot in Santa Catarina. This is a lot also within a perspective uh, of um, being made available in the next uh, few weeks. For the Santa Catarina lot, the so-called Trishon segment one, it will be delivered within the next few months. And then there is a second segment to be delivered this year. This is a drier region. Helicopters are flying around the mountains in that state, in the, in the southern states. And then we have another one to be delivered in the fourth quarter this year. And so we are on time, on cost for this year with all of the constructions. The next question comes from Pedro Manfredini. How is the company going to adjust its capital cost in the moments that come before uncertainties? For example, elections in 2022. That is part of our crystal globe. Companies such as EDP are out there in the world and they have this capacity to adjust the capital cost for the different risks out there. Of course, uh, Enrique Freire has already answered this question. Of course, we believe that Brazil is a market we should invest in and we want to invest in. Enrique, well, this is the $1 million question. We have to see how we're going to adjust our capital cost. Uh, we evaluate it twice a year. If we have an extraordinary event, we incorporate market conditions, debt, and also the exchange rate. Also, we have the country risk. Typically, that is all included in our capital cost. Brazil is very relevant. And I wanted to call your attention. We didn't arrive in Brazil yesterday. We've been here for over 20 years. These are routines that have been incorporated already. 2022, of course, so we have to be careful. These uh, and the moments that precede elections are very important, but we have to look at the long term. Our expectation is um, regarding the level of liquidity. In previous years, when we had elections and there was a lot of uncertainty around us, we made some decisions. For example, we closed Lot 21. We had a unique operation in the debt market, but we wanted to remove risk. We wanted to mitigate the short-term effects. So it's not only capital cost, because uh, that has to do with the long term. We may fail in the short term, but it's more unlikely that we will fail in the long run. The next question is from Liliana Yang from HSBC. Can you compare the price of wind and solar energy, current prices, and long-term trends, and why EDP Brazil and not EDP Renovables has invested in solar energy in Brazil? Thank you very much. Well, very well. I'm going to answer this question, and then I will turn over to Carlos. 
I wanted to make something very clear. Our win-win relationship with between EDP and EDP Hinovirus. It is uh, one of the best companies in terms of technology and solar energy. We are a company that does not have a tradition in investments in solar and wind energy, but we do have a lot of expertise on something that is essential which is called the Brazilian market. And therefore, we have a company that is very familiar with technology and a company that is familiar with the market. And then together, we can develop solar plants in utility scale, high levels, with a partnership between the two companies. And then each one of them will consolidate part of these solar plants. These partnerships are very favorable it is a partnership that has of two companies with the same controller. I wanted to add, Jean has said it all regarding Hinovavis, but regarding wind energy and the more specific question regarding wind and solar energy, of course, one of the aspects is location. Wind energy is more competitive in the Northeast. Their capacity is much higher, and solar energy is less competitive for this reason. But there is another one has to do with the exchange rate. Solar energy has or involves imported equipment and has made it more difficult in the Northeast. In the Southeast, solar energy is very competitive. And in a partnership with uh, Hinovivers, we have had different projects. Solar energy is competitive and it will become more so if we look into the f next five years. I am sure that solar energy will be a lot more competitive over the next few years. In the Northeast, we have wind energy and capacity factors that lead to competitiveness, but we already discussed with our providers in China solar energy and when we purchase uh, the panels for 2025 we can see what their production is going to be like and therefore they're going to become a lot more competitive in the next five years. The next question is from a physical person investor. How do you expect volume distribution energy to recover more strongly regarding volume and market? Are they similar? Very well. Thank you very much. I turn over to Martins for his answer. Thank you very much. Of course, this question has different factors. What we see today is that the industrial and the private market, and we have our two distributors, in the case of Sao Paulo, we've had growth of 10% and uh, other three in southern states. Of course, our expectation is that we will continue growing. We have had some changes in consumption as a result of the pandemic in the state of Espiritu Santo, where the industry is dedicated to expand and in the case of commodities, the industrial market reacts quickly. In the case of Sao Paulo, this is a this industry sector more related to the automotive sector, and therefore we have had some assemblers that decided to leave Brazil. We expect to close the year with higher volumes than we had in 2020. The next question is from Joana Freire. We'll have increase in the participation in selects in a relevant manner. Has the government demonstrated any interest? Thank you. Very well. I will answer and then turn over to Martins. We have an interest in eventual privatization of CLX. If it depends on the six of us here, we can guarantee that this will take place tomorrow, but it doesn't depend on us only. Now, please, Martins. 
Well, in this regard, what we're doing with our participation is uh, that we're trying to have a more competitive company that can generate value. Our objective and our role and the participation we have in the company today is uh, to improve the company's performance. The last question comes from Marcelo Sá from Itaú Bank. What happens if you do not find buyers for percents? Will you deactivate different players are trying to sell coal assets and they can't do so? Very well. I will start answering the question, then I turn over to Luis Otavio. Undoubtedly, uh, this is our last question. The six of us are here. We are a team. We work to serve the company, to serve the objectives of delivering to all of you our strategic commitments. We have different scenarios and initiatives. Definitely the scenario of decommissioning PSA, I would say, is our Z plan. That is the last possible scenario. We're working hard. It is an efficient plant. It's very important for the Northeast system. But we know there is a clear commitment. And of course, there will be no accounting adjustments. In, and so in due time, we will have an adjusted scenario. Our generation vice president, Luis Otavo, will continue. I understand what Marcelo is saying. But I want to add something. Pesin is not comparable. Their model is not comparable to another model that uses domestic coal and has a second line of uh, problem, the extraction of mineral coal, the coal to be used. Pesin uses imported coal using the port and therefore its environment and its impact on the environment is located at a single area and it's not the only one. So its business model is not comparable. And we think that there is a better possibility to have it successful when compared to other players and other things that may happen in the market in addition to the ones that João has just mentioned. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for your answers to all our questions. We now close the event. Just like to call your attention to our IR website, www.ri.com.br, and our IR team remains available through our email on the screen. Thank you, everyone.